<laughs> exactly. Can't complain. That, we agree on that. Okay. So let's open up to Amos, and I've got. I'm just going to give a short introduction of some background, so we know when we are, when we're when we're living here. Okay. Amos is eighth century B.C., which is 800 years before the birth of Christ. Um, there, at this point in the history of Israel, I wish I could show a map that everyone could see somehow, but you know, I haven't gotten that advanced yet in my technology here. Um, but it, the, the nation of Israel is divided into two, and you probably have heard this before, but after King Solomon, so there was King David, then there was King Solomon, and after King Solomon, there was a there was sort of a not a, there wasn't a war, but almost like a civil war, just a split, and the north formed a separate kingdom from the south. Does anyone remember what the northern kingdom was called? It's Israel and Judah's below it. That's right. Good job, Carla. You you get a gold star for today. the The northern kingdom is called Israel. Or sometimes you'll hear it called Samaria, okay. and the southern kingdom is called. Do you remember, you said it, Carla? Judah. Judah. That's right. Um, some, oh, that's Madeline. Why can I not find it here? Um, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, it's map number four. Oh, you're showing her a map. Some of your Bibles may have a map. It might be worthwhile looking at that. Uh, so you can see Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom. Northern Kingdom is called Samaria or Israel. Mm -hmm. So you got that's kind of important to know. If you hear Amos say Israel, it's not talking about the whole country. It's only talking about the northern half. And there's a, that's important because they had two different, the kingdoms were different. They had two different kings. And I, to, to, over simple, to simplify it, the northern kingdom was less obedient and less faithful than the southern kingdom. Mm -hmm. So the king in the south during the time of Amos is Josiah, and he was a good king. And by good, I mean faithful. He was worshipped Yahweh, the, the God of Isaac and Jacob, and didn't worship idols. And the king in the north is named Jeroboam, and he was a bad king. And by bad, I mean he, king says he did what was detestable in the sight of the Lord, which probably meant that he worshipped idols. But in a worldly sense, Jeroboam was a good, he was a successful king. He expanded the borders of Israel, the northern kingdom. He conquered some of the neighboring, defeated some of the neighboring tribes in battle. And the economy was strong. So he, if he was a president, he probably would have had a high approval rating because he, he made things better What's materially. This is the king in the north, Jeroboam, who was a bad king religiously, but a good king oh, okay. militarily and economically. And that's, this is all important to know because it plays into what Amos is going to say. So Amos was a prophet, and he, he was from the south. So he was from Judah, and he was called to be a prophet, but he did most of his prophesying in the north. So basically, he was a, he was a, and he was a normal guy, right? Yeah. When I say he was a prophet, he, that, he wasn't born as a prophet. He didn't go to seminary to be a prophet. Uh, it will learn. It will talk about his call, but he was simply someone who took care of trees. That he was worked in agriculture. He was a farmer, for lack of a better word, and God simply called him to be a prophet, which means, and a prophet is what? It's someone who essentially God calls to go give a message, uh -huh. and the message is mostly for the northern kingdom that you're you're bad and you're going to get punished. And the, the two sins, the two ways they're bad is one, idolatry, they're worshiping other gods, and two, they are rich and they are mistreating the poor. They're ignoring the poor, they're not taking care of the poor. And the, the, both of these things makes 
got angry and the threat is that they will be destroyed and I'm gonna spoil the story but they are destroyed in the year 722 the kingdom of Assyria conquers the kingdom of Israel the northern kingdom and just totally destroys the country and sends all the people basically kicks all the people out so if you live there you have to go live somewhere else and then that effectively destroys any kind of cohesion or unity among the people so that's what happened to them because they didn't listen that's it so in that sense Amos is not going to be a successful prophet <laughs> I've talked about that many times but a prophet usually is always is called by God always is given a message the message is almost always to repent to stop sinning and they almost always fail almost and I always sit do you know who you you've heard you should know this by now if you've been sitting with me this long but who is the only success the only really successful prophet in the Old Testament no we've read him before and I preach this all the time see if anyone here knows if you know and you're watching online you can type it in the only successful prophet in the Old Testament and think about what I'm saying what success getting the people to repent Jonah? bingo got it Jonah Jonah is the only really successful prophet in the old all the rest of them fail that's right. now I remember. and Amos is gonna fail too uh -huh. so that's the situation Amos is from Judah the south he's called by God to go to the northern kingdom Israel and say you're sinners you're you're rich your rich people are mistreating the poor and you're not and you're worshiping other gods God's gonna cut you down if you don't repent they don't repent and God cuts them down using the using the nation of Assyria God uses the nation of Assyria as his cudgel to beat them with okay. make sense all right chapter one the words of Amos one of the shepherds of Tekoa what he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam son of Jehoash was king of Israel he said the Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem the pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of Carmel withers so Carmel was a mountain where they committed a lot of idolatry it was a, it was a religious place and you can already hear the Lord, Lord is roaring the Lord is angry the Lord is very upset this is what the Lord says and if uh, if you look at a map what Amos does here is such a clever theatrical bit of rhetoric uh, he's gonna name nations that surround Israel and he's gonna go I think it's clock clockwise he goes in a circle and he and he names all the nations around Israel and he s talks about how awful they are uh -huh. and that God is angry with them that they're sinful so it'd be like someone came and said and and, and talked about all the nations that were kind of China, they're bad, they're sinning. Russia, they're bad, they're sinners. Iran, they're bad, they're sinners. And he comes all the way around to all those nations and finally he says, and America, you're bad and you're sinners. So he, 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 he gets the audience. Everyone who heard Amos would say, yeah, those no good people from Damascus. Yeah, those no good people from Gaza. Yeah, those no good people from Tyre. And then he names them. And it's like they, you know, that cuts deep, right? So that's what he's going to do. It's great. This is what the Lord says: For three sins of Damascus, and for four, I will not turn back my wrath. Now that's the saying he's going to use: For three sins and for four. In other words, their sin is piled up. It's just a, it's a euphemism. I will send fire upon the house of Hazael that will consume the fortresses of Ben Hadad. I will break down the gates of Damascus. I will destroy the king who is in the valley of Avin. And the one who holds the scepter in Beth Eden, the people of Aram, will go into exile to Kir, says the Lord. And everyone would say, yeah, right? You'd cheer for those dirty Damascus jerks. God's going to kill them. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Gaza, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath, because she took captive whole communities and sold them to Edom. So right, God's mad at what? That they're slavers. And that's what's so unique about this God. I I can't emphasize this enough. 
the other the, the pagan gods the gods of other countries were not like this this god is always concerned with the weak and the poor and the slaves and that notice what god's angry with them for that they took slaves and sold them in other country in other pagan religions that is not how their gods were it would have been if you were taken as a slave they would have assumed that that god was angry with you that you you must have deserved it right you and if you were and i've talked about this before, if you were rich and you were powerful well and this is rash this is very rational the gods must be happy with you because they've rewarded you right with you know who if if the gods are in charge if the gods are running the show then if you're rich it's because they like you and if you're poor or a slave or you get defeated it's because the gods were displeased with you and if you read homer that's always how it right the the gods take sides in the battles between the greeks and the trojans and who if the gods are on your side you're going to win if the gods are against you you're going to lose that's the way they thought so for this god to to say no i'm mad at you because you've conquered this country and you've taken a bunch of them slaves and sold them that is so unique that is unheard of that's not how gods worked i will send fire upon the walls of gaza that will consume her fortresses i will destroy the king of ashdod and the one who holds the scepter in ashkelon i will turn my hand against ekron till the last of the philistines is dead says the sovereign lord and everyone will cheer yeah those no good edomites this is what the lord says for three sins of tyre that's another country and for four i will not turn back my wrath because she sold whole communities of captives to edom disregarding a treaty of brotherhood i will send fire upon the walls of tyre that will consume her fortresses and everyone will cheer those no good is your bible saying tyre people, people. Will cheer no i'm saying that okay i'm thinking no, how I'm far different are we filling this in she's emphasizing this <laughs> kind of so you understand you got a picture this is amos he's out there and he's preaching and he's got a crowd listening to him a crowd of israelites and that everything he's saying so far is going to make them happy because these are their rivals that i made that clear i think for three sins of, okay we did that one this is what the lord says for three sins of ammon even for four i will not turn back my wrath because he ripped open the pregnant women of gilead in order to extend his borders right so now god's angry with them why because they're violent because they're aggressive and they and they expanded their territory and they killed slaughtered women i will set fire to the walls of rabah that will consume her fortresses amid war cries on the day of battle amid violent winds on a stormy day her king will go into exile he and his officials together going into exile that's what that's what people did back then if you conquered a country then you would take all of their leaders all of their craftsmen everybody was important and you would make them leave which would cripple the local economy oh, yeah. and make sure that they never would rise up again and that's what's eventually going to happen that's what assyria is going to do to israel this is what the lord says for three sins of moab even for four i will not turn back my wrath because he burned as if to lime the bones of edom's king i will send fire upon moab that will consume the fortresses of kiriath moab will go down in great tumult amid war cries and the blast of the trumpet i will destroy her ruler and kill all her officials with him says the lord and i'm adding this in everyone would cheer because nobody likes the edomites notice though notice too what this sets up and this is important for the whole bible it's important to understand jesus how does god punish these nations how does god punish these nations how i mean it's right in front of you and who's gonna set it on fire i mean who, the other countries right war cries and the blast of the trumpet in all these cases god is saying these countries are going to be defeated well they're not it's not fire coming from the sky it's not like sodom and gomorrah and there's just you know magical brimstone falls down from the sky and it's other na god uses other nations to punish the nations he's displeased with 
Do you understand why that's important? And then God, that's what God does to, remember I said, that's what God does to Israel. He, who, does, who does God use to punish Israel? Assyria. Assyria, right? And eventually Judah is going to be destroyed. And who does God use to destroy Judah? Do you remember this? They, they take them into exile. The Babylonians. So when another country comes and conquers Israel, what do they assume? I feel I'm not making any sense, am I? No. Knowing what you know now, if another country comes and conquers you, what do you assume? Our country is no more. I mean, it's... But why do you assume it happened? Be by because God is angry with them. Yeah. This is so important. Other, if you don't understand this, if you don't understand this, you'll have no, you'll have no clue why the Pharisees were the way they were, why the Jewish people were where they at, were that when Jesus came. Right? Rome had conquered them, so they assumed that God was angry with them, that they had sinned. So. What do they do? They say, well, we must not be keeping the law well enough. Okay. We must not be obedient. God must be angry with us. And, and, you, and you have to, un so that's, you have to understand why they thought that. This is why they thought that. Because for 800 years, God punished them using other countries when they were disobedient. Okay. Is it Yeah. It's just, okay. I mean, I, sometimes I think maybe he allows some bad things to happen that were going to happen. That these, but it's, I guess he, it's the same as using those countries. Well, for, I'm not, I mean, we're not, I'm not making blanket statements it, about what's happening now or anything. I'm saying in the, in the Old Testament times, the, the Bible claims that it was God who caused. Assyria to conquer Israel and that it was God who called Babylon to destroy Judah That's what the way that it was going. God who orchestrated yeah. and it, it was God who orchestrated all of this and so when Jesus comes along and the Romans have conquered Israel the assumption is that God is in control of this and that God must have a reason for allowing the Romans to conquer us and the reason must be because somehow we are not faithful enough that is why the Jews were the way they were. And it makes sense. It fits exactly with what we're reading here. Yes. So I'm God just. God would intervene if, if we, you know, weren't angry with our nation. And it's why, and I guess this is the most important point, and it's why the Jews expected Jesus to conquer the Romans. Because that the Messiah is supposed to come and restore righteousness. And restore the favor. That, that's what Jesus opens up his ministry saying. The kingdom of God is here. The time of the Lord's favor is at hand. Which everyone would have understood to meant, okay, the Messiah is coming. He's going he's gonna to tell us how to be righteous. And, because, and, and if we follow him, that's going to that's gonna get rid of the Romans. Because the Romans were a symbol of the anger or wrath of God. So that's why they had the expectations they had of Jesus. Does it make sense? Yeah. Not, not really, though. Well, you look I'm like you're puzzled. I'm trying to mesh it all up with the idea that Jesus doesn't really punish. You know, but he, well, he allows, does. He allows he things. Other, or, the other country, no. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't. That assumption is not safe to make anymore. Okay. I don't think the Bible says that God the the Old Testament says that, that that God was doing that back then. I don't think it's safe to assume that when one nation conquers another that that God willed that. No. That's not a safe I'm conclusion not, yeah, to make. And I, I'm not suggesting that. you just make that did not intervene because it, it 
just works that way. I mean, in that nation that's being conquered, so there's another reason. Well, and based on what Whatever we're reading happens, here, it's reason. not knowing, not having a prophet to tell us what God is doing. I, it's more safe to assume that if one nation attacks another or goes to war against another, that God is going to be angry with that nation for doing it. Because we just read that God is angry with Edom for going to war against, um, who is it, Gilead, right? God is going to punish Edom for going to war. So it's not safe to draw, to think that you know what God is doing. And given, given that Jesus rejected this whole model, right? Because Jesus didn't overthrow the Romans. He didn't set the people free from Roman oppression at all. He didn't even try, right? Right. It, it tells us that, that God maybe is not very interested in whether one nation rules over another or beats another in war at all. That God is maybe a non-violent God that is yes. more interested in mercy and love and peace than he is in war or violence. Anyway, we're going to keep going. I just think it's important for you to understand how all this fits together because it does. Um, all right, now... Now it gets good. For three sins of Judah. And who's that? That's the northern kingdom. Now we're getting, we've come all the way around to six o'clock. Right? All the way in a circle down to the bottom. And they wouldn't, the, the, remember Amos is in Samaria. So they wouldn't have really liked the Judeans either. So they're going to be happy about this. For three sins of Judah and for four I will not turn back my wrath because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his decrees. Because they have been led astray by false gods. The gods their ancestors followed. I will send fire upon Judah that will consume the fortresses of Jerusalem. Okay? And that is a prophecy that came true when the Babylonians did it. But they, Judah doesn't get punished as quickly. So we've come all the way around. We have, we have said how evil all these other nations are. And now Amos is going to point the finger at the people listening to him. And he's going to say, you're sinful. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. In other words, this is uh, credit card companies, right? This is profiteering. This is uh, the loan, payday loan companies, people who take advantage of poverty to make money. So you sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as upon the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. So who does God care about? Who God cares about the poor. Look who's named. God cares about the needy. That's verse 6. God cares about the poor. That's verse 7. God cares about the oppressed. That's also verse 7. So they're, they're mad at those. God is mad at those who are taking advantage of the poor. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. That probably refers to prostitution. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. Now that, see that, that line is perfect because it combines every, it combines, they've taken a garment in pledge. That, that's what you would do if you were loaning. You'd loan money to somebody and then you would take their jacket in pledge to ensure that they paid you back. So these are people who are loaning money to the poor probably at interest and taking uh, what do you call it um, collateral yeah so this com and then they lay down beside every altar which refers to idolatry so they're combining worshiping idols with profiteering on the backs of the needy and this is what God is angry with in the house of their God this is verse 8 they drink wine taken as fines, right? Again, they fine poor people for just like they do today, right? For parking in the wrong place because there's nowhere to park in those in poor neighborhoods. Um, so they 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 and they're drinking wine, right? Which is a symbol of wealth. So they've gotten rich on the backs of the poor. Okay. That in the house of their god, they drink wine taken as fines. They dest I destroyed the Amorite before them. 
Though he was as tall as the cedars and as strong as the oaks, I destroyed his fruit above and his roots below. I brought you up out of Egypt, and I led you for 40 years in the desert. So what's that referring to? The Exodus. The Exodus. Yes, good. I gave you the land of the Amorites. I also raised up prophets from among your sons and Nazarites from among your young men. Is this not true, people of Israel? So this is God saying, look, didn't I take care of you? I, t I took you out of Egypt. I gave you a land. I killed everyone who was living there for you. <laughs> I set you up nice. And then, and then I even gave you prophet. I gave you religious leaders to teach you, but you didn't listen, right? This is God saying, look, I, I took care of you. I gave you everything you needed. I told you how you should live and you didn't listen. But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets not to prophesy, right? So they, the Nazarites were like monks and, and they enticed the monks to break their vows and the prophets, they said, don't prophesy, right? They said, shut up. We don't want to hear you, right? Which the, nobody, they didn't want to hear the prophets because nobody wants to be told that they're sinning. Now then, I will crush you as a cart crushes when loaded, when loaded with grain. The swift will not escape. The strong will not muster their strength. The warrior will not save his life. So don't, there's nothing you can do. Don't think that you're going to get out of this. There's nothing you can do to escape judgment. The archer will not stand his ground. The fleet-footed soldier will not get away. And the horseman will not save his life. Even the bravest warriors will flee naked on that day, declares the Lord. So that's... And again, the con notice how he describes it. It's talking about warriors. So it's clear he's going to he's gonna bring another nation into conflict with Samaria, the northern kingdom. And, and we already we know who that nation is. It's the Assyrians. So the Assyrian, he's saying the Assyrians are going to come in and all your soldiers, your, it doesn't matter how brave or strong they are, they're not going to make it. Which, again, was true. Okay, any questions or comments? <clears throat> All right. Oh, hi, Megan. Hi, Joni. Hi, Patty. Hi, Julie. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Reggie. Hi, yeah, Linda. Oh, Pat. Hi, Pat. Who else do we have? Oh, we got a good group today. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I do. You can tell, I think you can tell how much I love Amos. All right, chapter three, and here's where it keeps going. He's still going against Israel. Now he's, he's talking to the people in front of him. And you can tell a lot of the prophets got killed, and you can see why. Right? Hear this word the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family I brought up out of Egypt. I mean, this is, pastors don't do this. They get fired, right? It, imagine me standing up there on Sunday and just berating the congregation for all the bad things that they do that's that's what this, that's what he's doing hear this word of the lord has spoken against you O people of israel against the whole family i brought up out of egypt you only have i chosen of all the families of the earth therefore i will punish you for all your sins see that's a that's an important verse god says i chose you right I, only you you're special which is true god chose israel of all the nations to be his nation and because he chose them, he's going to punish them. Okay, this is like, the, I punish you, you tell your children, I punish you because I love you. Right? I, have to get, I, my kid, I have to give you a consequence because I love you, because I need to teach you better. So this is what God is saying, like a parent, saying because you're my nation, I have to hold you accountable and I have to teach you to be better. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Does a lion roar in the thicket when he has no prey? Does he growl in his den when he's caught nothing? Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground where no snare has been set? Does a trap spring up from the earth when there is nothing to catch? When a trumpet sounds in a city, do not the people tremble? When disaster comes, here's, this is the line. When disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? That's why I went on and on before about how if the Romans conquered you or someone else conquered you, you would assume that you that God was angry with you and that you had been disobedient and God was punishing you. All he's saying here is, look, when, when catastrophe comes upon you, 
don't you know that there's a reason for it? Don't you know that God has sent it for a reason? And again, I wouldn't make, I wouldn't use this to make a conclusion about anything going on today, but because Amos is a prophet of God, it applies here. Verse 7, Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. Right. So when God does things, he's going to tell his prophets that he's going to do it so they can let people know. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? The sovereign Lord has spoken. Who can but prophecy? So this is Amos saying, look, God has spoken. He's angry. He's giving me this message. I've got to tell you. I've got to warn you. Proclaim to the fortresses of Ashdod and the fortresses of Egypt. Assemble yourselves in the mountains of Samaria. See the great unrest within her and the oppression among her people. They do not know how to do right, declares the, the Lord, who hoard, plunder, and loot in their fortresses. So they're greedy. God is angry at their greed. That's They hoard, plunder, and loot in their fortresses. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. An enemy will overrun the land. He will pull down your strongholds and plunder your fortresses. That, and the enemy is? I want to drill this in your heads. Who's the enemy that's going to do this? Assyria. Assyria. This is what the Lord says. As a shepherd saves from the lion's mouth <clears throat> only two leg bones or a piece of an ear, so will the Israelites be saved, those who sit in Samaria. So God is saying... God is not going to destroy his own people entirely. There's going to be something left, but it's not. It's going to be, he compares what's left to, you know, if a wild animal comes and eats a sheep, the shepherd might be able to save a leg, right? <laughs> but the animal is going to get the rest. And of course, the animal is Assyria and the sheep is Israel. And God's going to save a piece, <laughs> but Assyria is going to eat most of it. So will the Israelites be saved, those who sit in Samaria, on the edge of their beds and in Damascus on their couches. And that's, again, that's a reference to their luxury. They sit on the edge of their beds and in Damascus on their couches. That they've got, they've got down, down pillows and blankets and silk, you know, silk sheets. And they're sitting on all their, in their mansions. But God is going to bring all that to an end. Hear this and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord, the Lord God Almighty. On the day I punish Israel for her sins, I will destroy the altars of Bethel. And Bethel, again, that's a, that's a hill. It's where Jacob laid down, but it had become a place where they had set up altars to pagan gods. The horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground. I will tear down the winter house along with the summer house, right? I'm, the, these, these, again, we're talking to rich people here. They've got their winter house and their summer house. They've got all this money, and God's going to destroy it all. Your vacation homes are not going to survive. The houses adorned with ivory will be destroyed, and the mansions will be demolished, declares the Lord. So, again, can, it's clear who we're talking to here. We're talking to these wealthy elites who have taken advantage of the poor and gotten very rich. And their vacation homes and their mansions are going to be destroyed by the Assyrians. All right, chapter 4. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan on the Mount of Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy, and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. <laughs> you got to love the picture here. I mean, so now he... <laughs> This is, again, why they got killed. He's calling this, the Israelite women cows. Yeah. Who are, and so he's, he's saying they're, he's calling them these, it's a steric, but these wealthy women who sit and they command their husbands to bring them things to drink. There are these haughty, elite, privileged women. This is uh, the Kardashians, right? This is the desperate housewives of Israel. These wealthy, rich women who are proud and arrogant. And he says, uh, the sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness that time will surely come when you will be taken away with hooks, the last of you with fish hooks. You will each go straight out through the breaks in the wall and you'll be cast out toward Harmon, declares the Lord. So it's not going to go well for you. Go to Bethel and sin. 
Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years. Burn leavened bread as a thank offering, and brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites, for this is what you love to do. Okay, this is important. So these these wealthy, elite, privileged people in, in Israel, they are also very devout. They and not and not they do commit idolatry, but they also worship they also worship the true God, and they're very proud about their worship, right? They bring offerings, they give big tithes, right? They, you know, it's the wealthy person gives big gifts to the church and shows up every Sunday and sings oh, songs. Okay. So these are, they're very devout. They're very, in, in terms of religion and in terms of outward piety, they make a very, they make a big deal out of their religious devotion. But that does, God, and, and the, it's, there's sar the sarcasm here in the tone. Um, Amos is saying, yeah, go, keep, go worship. Go bring your big ties. Go pat yourself on the back for how religious you are. It's not going to do you any good. Um, verse 6, I gave you empty stomachs <clears throat> in every city and lack of bread in every town, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. So God is saying, look, I've tried. It's like a parent saying, I've tried small punishments, right? I've tried sending you to your room. But now you're going to be grounded for months. So God is saying, look, I've tried to be gentle. I've tried, I've tried the tender love approach, and it hasn't worked. Now I've got to give you tough love. Um, so I sent, you, um, I sent you a famine, but you didn't return to me. I also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none, and dried up. People staggered from town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink. Yet you've not returned to me. So I sent you famine and I sent you drought. And these are kind of minor punishments right, that are hope. And God was hoping, look, I'll just, I'll just give you a little swat on the behind, and maybe you'll turn it around. But and that, that was the famine and the drought. But it didn't work. Many times I struck your gardens and vineyards. I struck them with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your fig and olive trees. Yet you've not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent plagues among you as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword, along with your captured horses. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps, yet you've not returned to me. Right? So God gave them small defeats on the field of battle. And that was supposed to be a sign, but they didn't listen. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were like a burning stick snatched from the fire, yet you've not returned to me. So God is essentially saying, I've given you all these little trials. I've tried to give you these disciplines, but you didn't listen. So now I've got to, now I've got to go the whole way and really destroy you. Therefore, this is what I will do to you, Israel. And because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. He who forms the mountains creates the wind and reveals his thoughts to man. He who turns down dawn to darkness and treads the high places of the earth. The Lord God Almighty is his name. Okay. Any questions online? I don't see any, any questions online. Okay, chapter 5. We'll probably stop here at chapter 5 and finish next week. Because so I think, what, what, is it, what are we at? Um, nine chapters. That brings us about halfway. Hear this word, O house of Israel, this lament I take up concerning you. Fallen is virgin Israel, never to rise again, deserted in her own land, with no one to lift her up. So we're, this is a metaphor. It's poetry. you got to be able to do poetry if you're going to read the Bible. He's creating a metaphor calling Israel a virgin woman and and she's fallen this is what the sovereign lord says the city that marches out a thousand strong for Israel will have only a hundred left so right uh, a city is going to send a thousand men into battle well they're 90% of them are going to be killed that's a really bad defeat uh, the town that marches out yeah a hundred strong will only have ten left this is what the Lord says to the house of Israel. Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel. Do not go to Gilgal. Do not journey to Beersheba. So in other words, don't go to these places of worship. If you're going to try to return, if you're going to seek me, don't go to these, to these places. Don't go to these churches, in other words, because these churches are corrupt. These places of worship are despicable to God. Don't, don't try to reach God there. 
For Gilgal will go into exile, Bethel will be reduced to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, for he will sweep through the house of Joseph like a fire. I will, it will devour, and Bethel will have no one to quench it. You who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground, he who made the Pleiades and Orion, those are constellations, who turns blackness into dawn and darkness day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land. The Lord is his name. He flashes destruction on the stronghold and brings the fortified city to ruin. You hate the one who reproves in court and despise him who tells the truth. Right? So you, you hate all the honest politicians and you hate all the lawyers who have integrity. Right? You only like the corrupt politicians and the sleazeball lawyers. You trample on the poor and force him to give you grain. Therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offenses and how great are your sins. Again, you can see the class, the class conflict here. It's the rich who have oppressed the poor that God is angry at. And you can see that over and over again. This isn't me. I'm not making this up because I'm a leftist. This is what the Bible says. I didn't write it. You oppress the righteous and take bribes. You deprive the poor of justice in the courts, right? Because the poor cannot afford Johnny Cochran. The poor don't have good lawyers, so they don't they don't win in court, but but the wealthy people, they could hire good lawyers. Therefore the prudent man keeps quiet in such times for the times are evil. Seek good not evil that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you. See, that, don't he's saying don't go to the church don't go to the houses of worship to seek me instead do what is right don't in other words, you cannot you cannot placate this god with your religious devotion if you are oppressing the poor right god does not care about your songs or your ties and your gifts if you are make if you are profiteering on the needy um Seek good that you may seek good, not evil that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you, just as you say He is. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. Look, if you if you turn it around, if you start doing what's right, you might have a chance. Is what He's saying. Therefore, this is what the Lord the Lord God Almighty says: There will be wailing in all the streets and cries of anguish in every public square. The farmers will be summoned to weep and the mourners to wail. There will be wailing in all the vineyards, for I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. Then he says, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Right? The day of the Lord is is this time when God will finally when God will act and reveal himself. And he's saying, You you go to church and you act like you want this is like today. People go to church and they pray, Lord, come soon. Lord, come come back. And Amos is saying, Don't don't ask for the Lord to come back <laughs> because it's not going to go well for you when he does. You better, you better get right with the Lord before you start praying for him to come. That's the message. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? The day will be darkness, not light. Right? That it's not going to be good for you when, if God came back now because you, you ain't right. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear. As though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. In other words, he, you, you'll run from one danger right into the mouth of another. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light? See, everyone thinks that when Jesus comes back, he's going he's gonna to take their side. Right? Everyone thinks that. Well, surely, when God loves us, right? So when God comes back, they assume that God is going to give them a pat on the head and tell them good job. And Amos is saying, and that was the case for these Samar Samaritans or Israelites. And Amos is saying, you're wrong. Don't think that God is on your side. God is mad at you. I hate, listen, this is harsh. Verse 21, I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. It's as if God were to say, I hate your worship services. Right? I do not like your songs of praise. I don't enjoy your hymns. And why? It's not because he doesn't like their worship style. It's because the, the things that they're doing, they're not, they're not being obedient. So God is not interested in their religious devotion. 
even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them, right? So you go, you bring your sacrifice and God won't take it. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. And this is, the, this is Martin Luther King's famous quote. You remember, you'll remember this from his um, I Have a Dream speech. So in other words, don't worship me, don't sing your songs, don't give big offerings. Instead, what you should do is this. Let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. That's what you should do. You should do justice for the poor. You should do justice for the oppressed if you want to repent and show God that you care about him. Don't sing your songs, but make it right for the poor and the weak. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the desert, O house of Israel? Right, so God's going back to the Exodus and saying, look, you didn't, you didn't make sacrifices when you were wandering in the desert. You've lifted up the shrine of your king, the pedestal of your idols, the star of your God, which you made for yourselves. So you've worshipped your own selves. You've worshipped the work of your own hands. And we do, idolatry is still alive today. We worship the stock market. We worship money. We worship the flag. We worship the military. And worship is whatever you, whatever you give primary importance to, right? Whatever you lift up and whatever you give your loyalty to whatever you make a priority in your life. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is God Almighty. All right, that's the, that's the end of chapter five. <clears throat> Hopefully I've made this more clear to you, what, what Amos is saying. You do love it. <laughs> I do. And I suspect that some of it might apply to us today. So I'm going to close with prayer. <clears throat> Uh, Lord, we thank you for gathering us together. Um, these words of Amos can apply maybe even to us. Um, Lord, we, we know that you care about the poor and the needy, and maybe we haven't done what we should to protect them, to look out for their interests. And so, Lord, we pray that we would be faithful to you and that we would do what we can uh, to bring justice to those who are oppressed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.